Greetings, mind crafters, and welcome to another thrilling Minecraft episode here. Um, my name is Kimberly Quinn. I just want to describe this day. I have to do this. I feel like you're all in my living room. I, I say that over and over because I feel it over and over. And uh, Giovanni, our golden retriever, just jumped up into his chair. It was golden retriever, uh, National Golden Retriever Day yesterday. So we celebrated in the woods with a nice long walk, a couple of belly rubs maybe. Uh, maybe one belly rub. And uh, it's a sunny, it's a glorious sunny day here in, in Vermont in February. And it's just our walk today, Giovanni and I were out in the woods the early, earlier this morning. And the sparkle when it's a bluebird sky and it's colder. I mean, it wasn't really cold, it was like 12 degrees, but um, very, very sparkly, gorgeous weather. And so, yay, welcome back, listeners. And I'm so grateful for all of you listening and so this, what we're going to talk about today is um, sort of continuing the discussion on the upper limit problem. And, and, and so the inspiration goes to Gay Hendricks, and I've now been listening to him. I just started listening to him on his podcasts, and uh, he's just kind of my, my, my newfound um, big thinker, great thinker, because he's got a lot of a lot of good wisdom to offer us about the upper limit problem, which I've always, you know, thought of and um, referred to it as the, you know, my own glass ceiling kind of thing. We all have one. Okay, how successful you are, it's there. This thing that the, you know, successful folks get really good about, you know, you know, digging into the the vault of the unconscious and bringing to surface their own limiting beliefs and talking back to them and busting through the glass ceiling. That's the difference, which is what we're talking about now. And I think I share with, with you my own personal visualization. You could even say it could be a meditation. I just sort of close my eyes. And sometimes they're open because I'm actively thinking a thought like, where'd that come from? You know, some limited, some, you know, crippling, limited, you know, fear-based belief tries to sneak into my head. And I picture Willy Wonka, you know, the, the uh, Willy Wonka movie at the end, you know, the re actual original one. Um, with Gene Wilder and, and uh, you know, he drops off the everlasting gob gobstopper, everlasting gobstopper, and they get into a little like rocket thing and they blow right through the glass ceiling of, of you know, Wonka world there. And that's what I picture for myself, um, eyes open or closed. That's what I'm thinking. I could be even be, you know, in a meeting or something and I, I get a, a, you know, sort of a shame based, you know, fear driven thought trying to you know suck the positivity you know f you know out of me and i stop it you know no i just and mentally i just blow right through the glass ceiling it's a super good visual so i thought i would share it with you okay so yeah and this will be the last part i'm only a, i'm barely a fourth of the way actually i've ridden farther than what we're talking about today but hopefully this will prompt you to purchase the book by Gay Hendricks. I'm telling you, it's right what I, it's exactly what I need to hear right now. So it's called The Big Leap. And, and then The Big Leap, and then there's usually like a little subtitle on most books, right? And it's Conquer Your Hidden Fear and Take Life to the Next Level. And he's amazing. And when, I love it when the author, in not in person, in person, it was a podcast I was listening to on the way into Champlain last week. Uh, when they really match up, like they're, they're the genuine real deal, which is true for me is true. The high majority of the time, actually authors, most authors, myself included, write how they write, how they talk. And I just, you know, it's a conversation on paper for me. And it's the same way with, with gay. He talks about, um, a lot about his wife and stuff. So I listened to him on the podcast and it was totally in sync with his book, even his actual writing style. I mean, it's just how he talks and I would strongly encourage this, this book. But anyway, okay, so the upper limit problem, your own glass ceiling. And so he talks about there are four hidden barriers. And and um, we sort of talked about the uh, one of them last time. And I, and I think it's the one that really hooked me into sticking with the book because he talks about it kind of in the beginning, very, very beginning as well. Because uh, I think it just, I think it, it probably would relate to probably, um, I'm guessing this since, you know, there are 8 billion people in the world, but probably a good amount, maybe even the majority of them can relate to 
to the first one. And so he says that the, the four hidden barriers all have something in common. And although they seem very true and real, these, what he, what Gay Hendricks calls the four hidden barriers are based upon beliefs about ourselves that are not true or real. And that's super important to get. And, you know, I have these chats with, with my Minecrafters frequently that feelings aren't facts for one. So we try to make, you know, decisions based on feelings and that's not good. If we try to make these decisions or even just forget decisions, even just communicate via texting, which was what most of them do based on all this assumption making that's based not, you know, in any kind of truth whatsoever. Think of where that banter is going. I mean, it's just, it's all false. It's just all fake causes a lot of unnecessary drama. And so, you know, when we become more aware of this and our, what our own mind chatter is, we can really grab, you know, the horse by the reins. Oh, I just had a squirrel moment. Stay with me on this one because I used it with my Minecrafters the other day. I've used it in episodes occasionally, but not recently. And they, it really, I watched their eyes get big. You know, every class I have is different. They're, I, you know, I love young adults. They're just, oh my God, I, it's my niche, as they say. And obviously they're all different spirits in there. So each, in each and every semester is different. Um, but this, this, this class, two classes just got big eyes, right? Sort of spontaneously, we were talking about the brain. It was talking about the big, the big neuron chapter. So lots of brainy stuff on that day. And that led into the practicality of controlling our, our thinking, which is also what we're talking about today. And I said, picture, I asked about anyone, you know, um, seen an actual real horse race or just seen it on TV. It didn't have to be in person. And a few hands went up. And I said, have you seen a big, 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 you know, thoroughbred horse? And more hands went up. And I said, picture that majestic animal, beautifully groomed and and just, uh, you know, powerful, muscular and powerful and gorgeous and majestic, flying around the track at the Kentucky Derby or something. And then I asked them, how big is the jockey usually? And they all kind of said, really little, tiny, you know. I said, yeah, they're petite, usually under 100 pounds or maybe 100 pounds at the most. And that little itty bitty jockey is in full control of that powerful, powerful animal. Think about that. So when we think about the thoroughbred being our magnificent mind and us being the jockey controlling that magnificent mind, this is a really good, you know, metaphor or analogy for what, for what we need to do because, because the mind is so powerful, just like that magnificent horse. Um, and, and we can feel small in comparison, but really we, um, can be in charge and need to be in charge. Actually, if the race is going to be successful, if we're going to win from within, win our, win our own race, we need to be the ones in charge and steering that powerful, that powerful, powerful animal or organ in our case, we need to be in charge. And, and then, and then also once we, you know, really kind of get it just like anything else, it gets easier. So pulling those reins, we're kind of giving a little, you know, pull on each side and the, and the horse does the rest of the work. Same thing with the brain. So the very first one came up earlier and it's, it's what, cued it in for me for sure because and the first hidden barrier uh gay talks about is being that feeling of being fundamentally flawed which is obviously shame we've talked about that in a lots of episodes because i'm on an anti-shame campaign and we've talked about you know in life in general no matter whether it's anxiety depression adhd which i would much prefer to call the fast mind club um autism spectrum bipolar addiction whatever it is it's not that fill in the blank thing that that pulls us down, right? And including the limit of limiting beliefs we're talking about here, it's the, excuse me, it's the shame attached to whatever said difference in wiring um, or our belief system. It's the shame attached like a barnacle on the ass of our well being. I mean, that's really what it's about. And so when I first read this, I'm like, oh my God gosh, that, that just tapped into it. And I've been doing a lot of work, doing a lot of work on myself for many years. And that, that really actually believe, you know, we all have something we're, we're destined to learn in this life. And my lesson is definitely self-love. And after, you know, the, the very turbulent childhood I had growing up with 
um, to alcohol, you know, very abusive alcoholic parents and a lot of mental illness in the house. It's been, and I'm not, it's again, it's, I'm always sharing to help other people. I'm way past it. I forgave them decades ago. It's just about sharing with you and, you know, working through all that stuff. And obviously things are generational. So they're, I'm sure working through their stuff and everything else like that. Um, I'll tell you though, that, that inherent, you know, when that gets in the hard drive, that hook, that, that, that shame, you know, based hard drive that's, you know, in telling us that we're not worthy of love or worthy of being wealthy, you know, that we're fundamentally flawed, that we're damaged goods that leaks into every single aspect of our lives. So, you know, and I, 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 you know, if, if you, if you've, if you've grown up in an addicted home, you know that, you know, we do the backstroke and shame, not that you have to have an addicted home to do the backstroke and shame. I mean, really, you know, that dysfunction is all coming from that place as well. I think the addiction maybe just amplifies it. Um, certainly, uh, you know, shines a light on it maybe a bit more, but, uh, you know, I had a lot of messages to the point it was even said to me, you know, things would have been easier if I had, I not been born. So that was a lot to work through. And so now here, fast, fast forward, I'm a fabulous 59 now, and I've got a, a I've, I've got my passion project going really well. Mind, mind craft online is going really well. And it's, it, it's filling me up with just, I, 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 I'm loving being able to make a difference in people's lives, especially with any, it's ageless, but I'm just, you know, especially with Gen Z's, that's my niche, but it doesn't, you don't have to be a Gen Z. Um, and, and, and just, it's so fulfilling and rewarding and I get to do all my, you know, my, my, it's a creative outlet for me. And it's just, it's just so, it's been such a good ride so far. And this is why I'm talking about this book. Because here I am enjoying all of this authentic joy with my passion project. And, and, and abundance is really, the momentum is really picking up with that. And I caught myself in this. I caught myself in this thinking, God, that where did that creepy little dementor come out? You know, what crack did that little, or what hole in the ground did that, you know, shame thought come out of? Because I thought I was past all that stuff. And here's the thing, and I'm past it for the, I'm past it you know, I've significantly passed it compared to, you know, where I was years ago. But obviously there's still a little residual because it, because all of a sudden I'm feeling so good. And I think, you know, that, um, my particular vehicle of learning has been with money, you know, like early on in my life, not, not so much recently, but, but now I guess what I'm saying now is just trying again, you're feeling so good. Your new story has been in play for a couple of decades so much healing, so much good momentum, and darned if I'm going to let you, like a little dementor, little limiting belief, fear-based limiting belief is based in shame, shame incarnate is trying to get in the way of, of me achieving and enjoying wealth. And I thought, wow, I, yeah, here I am thinking I'm, I'm, you know, I nailed it. It's over. No more quizzes. Again, I, you know, I, I've talked about quizzes a lot. Life continues to give us quizzes until we get an A plus. You can even have a 90, you can even have a 99 out of 100 on the quiz, but you got to get that, you got to nail that last point for those quizzes to go away. And, and I don't know how many points I have left. I didn't think it was very many, but boy, did it, did that, that little Dementor try to throw a wrench in my happy bubble. You know, I've had gotten a couple of clients close together recently and, um, you know, and uh, people buying it off the internet and it, this freaking little, you know, uh, fear-based thoughts coming out of the vault of my unconscious dressed like faceless hooded grim reapers were trying to pull me down. And it was, it was really meant, but for me, it's God, you might say universe source, higher power, whatever you want to. This book was, was referred to, to me by a friend in uh, my mastermind group, right when that story I just told you was happening. A couple of clients, people buying on like start starting to think, wow, this is really, this is really picking up. And, and that's when it was like the, the fear-based crap was starting. And then the book came into play all a God thing. You can say universe thing if you want to, whatever. And I just had this like almost chill up my back because I'm meant to read this right now to once and for all, once and for all, kick those shame dementors to the curb with my new story 
of abundance, meaning joy, happiness. Joy. I mean, I'm happy anyway. I'm talking about the bigger, big money story. Happiness, joy, and just abundance, 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 and fulfillment. And, you know, and how Gay had talked about this was to push that envelope a little bit further. So for the last two weeks, I think it was two weeks ago I started reading this book. The last two weeks when I've had those little dementors trying to knock me down, I've been saying, you know what, no, I'm going to feel good. And I'm talking about my specific context with my new Minecraft business. I'm going to feel good for a little while longer. I just got another client, just checked the website the other day. I have another, an individual just bought it again. I'm going to feel good for a little while longer. And this is what I've been telling myself. And it's working. They're Because they just, they're going away. Those little, those little fear-based shame dementors are getting pulled back into their hole. So I wanted to share that with you. That's just the first barrier. Feeling fundamentally flawed. And you know what's also super cool about this author, and I, I, I like him, I think, too, because I, I relate to his writing style because... Uh, though we're not exactly the same, we have very similar, you know, we, there's a real personal touch here. You feel like he's sitting, he's, I feel like he's sitting on the chair next to me, having a conversation with his feet up on the coffee table. And I, I just personally, I appreciate that kind of, that kind of writing style. And so the second barrier, a he hidden barrier, Gay talks about being disloyalty and abandonment. So, um, this one is about, uh, how do I explain this? Gay explains it as like, if you, if you got where you are, let's say you're getting where you are. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm just barely starting. I just launched the business in mid August. So I'm, it's, it's February right now. So, you know, we're just closing on, on six months here, but let's say you're in the process of being successful. You're already on your way. Like a little bit of like, I've got really good momentum going right now, which is fantastic. Or you're already there and uh, you got all kinds of, you know, um, again, my example is money. You, he talks about love in here and just all, and then the whole package together, blah, blah, blah. Let's say your business is cruising, it's cranking. And so did you get there by, by sort of breaking, um, your family's rules, like whether they were spoken or unspoken or whatever. And, and then the other part is, uh, he, he says like when people ask themselves, even though I'm successful, did I, did I blow it as far as, you know, failing to meet, you know, my parents' expectations? And so he uses a couple. I don't have a per personal example for this one because this one isn't mine. The first one is definitely me. And again, I, I would guess a lot of, probably a lot of people. This one I didn't relate to as much, but I'm going to explain it to you. But he uses a sort of an example of um, these two people, these two young, young people who fell in love and when they were opposite family, like the families are opposites. One was, one kind of had this old, old wealth, New England family with this old, old money, very kind of prim and proper. And, um, uh, and you can picture it. Right. And the, and the, what the, well, soon to be wife came from like a loosey goosey hippie family. And so they basically, there was this, there was these big, there were these big plans for this, you know, really pinkies out wedding and everything like that. And the two of them disappeared and went to Reno or Vegas or something, I forget, and got married. So the, the, the husband, young husband, did not want to tell his parents, you know, because it was a whole very structured, again, pinkies out, very blue blood, aristocratic situation. When they, when they told her family, they were elated. They just had an immediate party that night and just, you know, just two very, very polar opposite families. And then they ended up hitting their upper limit um, I think they were having uh, a wild time, um, uh, just newly married. Let's say just, let's just say consummating their marriage out in the woods somewhere. And they both ended up with poison ivy or poison oak or something all over their bodies. And, and Gay Hendricks talks about how it, that it was, it, oh, and the, and the young man was a doctor. So he, he knew all about poison oak and had treated it all these times. And he even says that, like, what the heck? How did I not notice that, 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 that? And, and Gay Hendricks talks about how this is how, you know, how, well, mostly him, but they hit their upper limit with this, this self-sabotaging, you know, limit, limiting the belief that they had to do things um, according to the spoken and unspoken rules of his family. 
And then, uh, and then he talks about eventually they called his family, blah, 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 blah. And all, and then it was like a big, huge relief because that was, that was taken care of. That was just one example. There could be lots of examples about, about that. And then the third one, and it's interesting um, because I feel I feel very self aware at a fabulous fifty nine. I'm not saying I've rung the bell on it because we're always, you know, works in, in progress. But certainly, if I compare to my twenties, thirties, and and forties, especially you know the farther back you go, there's miles and miles of difference. I feel incredibly comfortable in my skin, with in the, with the self acceptance and self love and self compassion and all that stuff. And I and I it's interesting because when I read this third barrier, um. I, I I did relate to it. I'm good, thinking just when you think you're you know, you're moving along, there's just something else that pops up, and it's amazing because Wayne Dyer, one of my faves, you know, I talk about him a lot. Um, talks about when the student is ready, the teacher approaches, you know, and the teacher is there. And Gay Hendricks is my current teacher, at least for for the last couple of weeks, and for definitely for some more time here. The the hidden barrier number three is believing that more success brings a bigger burden. And when I first read that, I'm like, I don't feel like that. And then he actually, he also talked about this on his podcast because when he was born, his mom was, I think, in her early 30s or something. And she was, I'm not looking at that, so I'm, don't quote me exactly in the weeks, but I think she was, he was, she was pregnant with him barely. And then his, his dad died. Um, unexpectedly, his dad died. And he has an older brother who's, I think, six, five or six years old or something like that. So he was born into, you know, obviously, and I'm not passing judgment on his mom. Um, she was obviously horribly grief stricken and young and already had a child. And he was born into this situation where it was super stressful and um, feeling like he was, you know, um, convicted of this crime of being a burden. And he also talks about, thank God, how his, his grandparents were next door because they were able to give him all of that love. And he said they were instrumental, like, thank God for them next door. And that that's also my life story, too, because uh, my mother got, had me young and and uh, not ready, didn't want the, I'm going to say didn't want the pregnancy, uh, and said all kinds of things about that and did different things, you know, throughout my life to let me know that. And so I, I, I too, just like Gay Hendricks, was, you know, convicted of a, of a crime that wasn't, you know, my fault either. And, and I, until I read that third burden thing, I never, just by reading that sentence, I'm like, I don't really feel like that. I'm feeling like I'm in the momentum with my business and everything. And I, I don't feel like the, the, you know, the more people, the more clients I get, the more, the more people sign register for the course. I had, I wasn't feeling like that at all. Then I read the rest and then I heard him on his website. I'm like, Oh my God. And then like the, I had like this hallelujah epiphany moment. So I'm grateful to, to Gay for shedding light on that because that's something in the vault that's probably been, it's quite possibly been my biggest thing to heal from, you know, because when your own mother or father or both, for, for me, it was my, was my mother, my, for your own mother to tell you she wished, you know, you should have been an abortion and I did you a favor by keeping all this stuff that's a biggie. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big one. And then as we've discussed before, um, you tend to seek out that confirmation. Like if my own mother doesn't love me, who's going to, right? And this is as a little kid, you're not thinking that you're not putting language to that as a child. You just internalize it and you put it out there. And, it, and then it's why people don't treat you. It's also part of, not all of it, because I'm the fast mind club and I, my wiring is also, I have impulsivity. It's definitely a part of the reason, and I'm not saying it with blame, I'm saying it with like an excavation, post-excavation, figured it out situation. Definitely part of um, the reason I had I had such financial difficulty. Not, it's complicated. It's not all that, but it definitely played a role because where did I get the in inspiration from that? I know. Susan Forward's book, the uh, Toxic Parents, that's a really good one because there's an example in there. It's a case study of this. I think he's a cop. It doesn't matter. But he had a very similar situation where his mom told him that she wished he was never born or the dad doesn't matter. Um, and he became in financial ruin over it. And later he figured out that it's because it was just another way to rub himself out and to get confirmation 
for that feeling of being worthless and, and, and not valued. I'll, you know, I'll show you, I'll rub myself out too. It also people sadly end up, you know, sometimes deciding to take the final solution as we call it with ending their lives over it. Cause it's pretty heavy stuff. Um, but there are all different ways we can look for confirmation and, and finances are definitely one of them. And then finally, uh, Gay Hendricks talks to us about the hidden barrier number four, which is the crime of outshining. And I think this one is probably quite common in families, um, uh, where basically the message to the self is as far as the upper limit problem, or what I like to say is the glass ceiling, right? The limiting belief Let's masterminds, my mastermind group, we just call it the limited beliefs, um, is that there's, there's a message that we tell ourselves that I, you know, I can't possibly expand to my full success because if I were to do so, I might outshine and then, you know, fill in the blank and make, you know, her or him look bad or feel bad or, you know, disappoint the parents or whatever. And I think this is probably very common. I I know, um, especially if there's, you know, in a dysfunctional family and there's, um, you know, the roles that are, I'm thinking of addictive families, but it really doesn't, you know, you can take that out and they can still happen. Just it's probably more, far more prevalent in, you know, addicted families, but there's often the golden child and there's, uh, you know, so if the scapegoat, you know, who's kind of, you know, takes on the blame for all the family's dysfunction, uh, you know, that scapegoat's going to have a hard time letting themselves shine um, when, you know, that sister or brother is, is, is the favorite one, you know, considered to be, you know, the high achiever, the leader of the family, all that stuff. And that's, I would guess this has got to be um, pretty common. So he says this is a barrier, th- that this particular barrier is very common among gifted and talented children because, you know, they've gotten a lot of their parents' attention but they also kind of get this message that comes along with it that says, don't shine too much, you know, because you you can make others feel bad or look bad or whatever. So the gifted child, he taught, used the word convicted a lot, convicted of crimes. The gifted child's often convicted of being like an attention stealer, basically. And this can hold small children back for sure. Um, he uses an example specifically with, with, um, a musician and his, I think his sister died of leukemia or something and that got in the way of him being able to play, you know, his, his music for quite a while and understandably so, you know, it, but it's still, um, and I'll let you, you can uh, pick up the book and read the rest of that. And that's kind of an extreme example, but I, I think even if there's not something as severe as something, you know, going on in a family where there's been a, you know, a, a death of a child or something like that, I think it can just happen with again with favored children and and the child is not favored outshining that favored child that can cause definite problems and then just having that um gifted child in general even with other kids if they're not in the family you know because they're so used to to just doing what they do naturally whether they're gifted with math or music or you know um you know um g- gymnastics who knows just outshining that they can, you know, little kids are kind of conscious of how they make other, other people feel a lot. And I think this is, might be one that um, is also very common. So there you have it. Those are the four um, hidden barriers to, um, you know, what get in our way, what, what kind of um, get in our way from being successful, the limiting beliefs in sort of the way that the upper limit problem can, can manifest. And so, um, yeah, this is totally working for me. I'll tell you, this book is fantastic and I'm definitely ready for these messages myself. And just even about, I don't know, maybe almost halfway to halfway through. And I'm really excited to read the rest of it. And if, if you are, I, you know, my, my examples have been with money and, and my new business and things, but again, if you're hitting that, That glass ceiling in, in a relationship, you know, in some other way, I strongly encourage you 
to uh, purchase the book *The Big Leap* by Gay Hendricks because it's really, really good. And so, that's it. Talk back to those guys. We gotta talk that negative self-talk. We've gotta talk back to it. That's the only way we can re, you know, sort of rewire, reboot the hard drive to live our best lives and fill that, fill it with all kinds of positive new programming. So, uh, that's it. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day. Thank、you